Tonight we'll have the latest on PIV Key and show you the three gang members who are in jail tonight. And he's a police exhibit keeper accused of discarding that weed fudge which ended up being consumed by St. Luke's students tonight. We'll tell you why he was back in court. Plus, 16 years after he killed Sandra Ruiz, Daryl Grant apologized to her family in court today. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Thursday, April 18th, 2024. Good evening with your news. I'm Indira Craig. La Express es un servicio que te permite realizar transacciones financieras cómodamente en comercios cerca de ti. Con Atla Express puedes retirar efectivo, realizar pagos de facturas y tarjeta de crédito comprar recargas y transferir entre tus cuentas. Solo necesitas una identificación válida y tu tarjeta de débito Visa de Atlantic Bank. Si no eres cliente de Atlantic Bank, siempre puedes disfrutar de este servicio pagando en efectivo. Atla Express es fácil, conveniente, seguro y está cerca de ti. Global rise in temperatures due to climate change Increase the severity of dry weather conditions Atla Express es un servicio que te permite realizar transacciones financieras cómodamente en comercios cerca de ti. Con Atla Express puedes retirar efectivo, realizar pagos de facturas y tarjeta de crédito, comprar recargas y transferir entre tus cuentas. Solo necesitas una identificación válida y tu tarjeta de débito Visa de Atlantic Bank. Si no eres cliente de Atlantic Bank, Siempre puedes disfrutar de este servicio pagando en efectivo. Atla Express es fácil, conveniente, seguro y está cerca de ti. Global rise in temperatures due to climate change increase the severity of dry weather conditions experienced in Belize. Forest fires, dust buildup and contamination of our power lines can result in power interruptions. At BEL, we continue to do our part to minimize the impacts of challenging weather conditions and improve the reliability of our power line system. You can help. Report forest fires or damaged power line structures using our BEL 24-7 app or call us at 0800-BEL-CARE. That is 0800-235-2273. We continue to serve you. The BEBL presents its Mega All-Star All Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, April 21st at the Belize Civic Center. Gates open at 4 p.m. and showtime is at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., we kick off with the Cellular World three-point shootout. <laughs> For a whopping $1,000 cash and a Samsung phone, 6.45 p.m. is the Nando's Slam Dunk Contest. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. For a humongous $2,000 cash and...
event at 7.30. All the big stars from the different teams will collide in the Rude Boy All-Star Classic to see who will win the Mega Cash and bragging rights. Bang! That one goes down! There will be halftime giveaways including TV, fans, microwave, and more. Plus, mega performance by Britney. Britney Star. So mark it on your calendars and get your tickets for the BEBL All Star Sunday. Sunday, April 21st at the Belize Civic Center. Sponsored by Rude Boy, Cellular World, Nando's, Channel 5, Dolphin Production, Channel 7, Love FM, Creme, and Maya Island Eve. Tenemos la capacidad técnica, operativa, profesional y la infraestructura de poder establecer una, una atención neurológica de alta calidad. Que no se pierda tiempo de forma innecesaria para poder al final del día llegar al mejor de los resultados y la mejor opción para el paciente. These charter mints aren't from navigating along the coast. This morning, the 2023. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Shirley Kalfil, and here is what's ahead for you on Southern News Tonight. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight. Good evening. With your news, I'm the bureaucrat. Please, you're watching the Nation Station, Channel 7. Hey Belize, come join us at the Belize Earth Day at Creatively Green Pop-Up happening at the Memorial Park on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop from a wide selection of eco-friendly boots like Sol Handmade Clay Jewelry, Hello Body Belize, Naturally Belize Cosmetics, Belize Eco Bag, Zero Belize, and so much more. Enjoy delectable food and beverages from Don Ceviche, Iguana Stop, Brain Freeze Margaritas, just to name a few. Live performances by QB and Band, Britney Star, and Yes Talia. For more details, call us at 227-2420. The Belize Earth Day pop-up is brought to you by the Belize Tourism Board in partnership with the Belize City Council. Sponsors include DigiWallet, Coca-Cola, and the Belize Waste Control Limited. See you on April 20th at the Memorial Park. Belize, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. The alleged co-leader of the PIV gang, 41-year-old Edwin Drive Flowers and two of his associates, 25-year-old Gaston Barrow and 32-year-old Kenyon Dominguez, were taken to court today. They were arraigned for a total of six counts, two for possession of a firearm and 21 rounds of ammunition, as well as four counts of drug trafficking for a total of 26 pounds of marijuana and five pounds of cocaine. On the charge sheet, it says the men were found with these items on St. George's Key. Immediately after their arraignment, police escorted the trio to the Belize Central Prison, where they were remanded until July 22nd. They were all unrepresented, but before leaving the courtroom, Edwin Flowers asked the sitting senior magistrate, how quick can we get a trial date for this matter? The answer was inconclusive, but he was told that he can apply for bail at the High Court. Now, during the raid on St. George's Key, police say they found a number of firearms, a total of five. But in court, the trio was only charged or connected to one of those five firearms and an amount of weed and cocaine. Here's an update on what we learned yesterday. This is a .223 rifle. This is a 40 millimeter pistol outfitted as a Mach 10 with sound suppressor. This is the M4 carbine. This is a 9mm pistol and this is the 5.7 times 28 mm. Not a very common weapon in Belize. These bundles are the 2.5 pounds of marijuana and the 5 pounds of cocaine found on island number one. 
they were found along with a .223 rifle. Searches were conducted on that island, and uh, the search led to the discovery of 12,000 grams of cannabis. Um, it was parceled off in a number of parcels, and uh, 2,300 grams of cocaine. Um, that was in two separate kilo size um, parcels and uh, one 223 rifle. On the island, police also found three individuals um, from the PIV area. Those persons and uh, the drugs and firearm were brought to Belize City for processing and uh, the three individuals have since been arrested and charged for drug trafficking and uh, for um, keeping unlicensed firearm. That means the three persons charged, Edwin Drive Flowers, Kenyon Dominguez and Gaston Barrow, will only be charged for these items. Police searched two nearby islands where they found the other weapons, all high powered and deadly and possibly used in recent murders. We went and conducted searches on two other islands, um, which we believe the PIV gang members have some connection to. And uh, on one of those islands, we found one M4 carbine rifle, one assault 5.7 caliber rifle, one two to tr one twenty two rifle, one point forty caliber handgun, and one nine millimeter handgun. So a total of five firearms were found, three of which are rifles and two handguns. No one was on that island, and so those items will be deposited as found property. The term found property is usually a signal that police and the suspects have struck a deal where the criminals disclose the stash spot for weapons or drugs in exchange for having charges dropped. We know that the volume of drugs disclosed yesterday was less than the amount listed on the charge sheet in court today. So did that kind of trade-off happen in this case where guns were given up in exchange for the freedom of persons who could have faced charges? Today, the Minister of Home Affairs said he knows nothing about that, but he knows the bust is historic. I'm not familiar with that trade-off, Courtney. You would have to probably ask the commissioner that. I am aware that the police made uh, perhaps one of the biggest busts of high-powered firearms in the history of this country. I haven't seen so, uh, such a cachet of uh, a high-powered firearm all together at once. And so um, I want to commend the police on their bust yesterday. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a substantial quantity of cannabis and a substantial quantity of cocaine as well. And so um, I, I think it deserves commending. So did they collaborate with the Coast Guard though in tracking down this island? Uh, for, to my knowledge, uh, no, but I believe uh, they did have a captain who may have taken them, who might be attached to another department. I can't say if it's Coast Guard or not. And while the police, specifically the SPU, is celebrating the significant bust, part of the backstory is why this particular gang has been named in so many city murders. The thing is that they are also and have long been a part of the LIU intervention program. In that capacity, they have been working with police and mediators. But on the other side, police now believe that those same LIU actors have been instrumental in illegal gang activities. Moses says he is pained by the contradiction. Sir, I believe uh, Drive and another LIU member was found on the island. They were charged on um, the PIV island. They were members of LIU. So now what happens? Do they get uh, removed from the program? Um, that is the natural consequence, um, Courtney. And it pains me a lot as minister because we have been working a lot uh, over the past few years with some of these young men, not all of them, 
uh, who have indicated that they do not want to lead this life. And I could tell you right off the bat that last year, PIV was extremely quiet, was extremely dormant. They were complying. They were a part of the LIU. Uh, they were active in positive ways. And so it is very disturbing. Um, but if you have been following uh, the trends uh, lately um, with the passing and the murder of Jose Matos, there was left a huge void, as you might have known. Mr. Matos um, was a major supplier uh, in Belize. And so perhaps the temptation got the better of them. And uh, based on these high-powered weapons, it's quite possible uh, that this new group uh, is working along with cartel elements. And so we have to look at that possibility because these guns just don't show up just like that. And as you know, the cartels are always looking uh, for someone to work with for the illegal supply of cannabis. And it's been something I've been saying since day one when we got into office. This illegal trade of cannabis is killing so many Belizean young men um, because of the turf wars that were happening. Um, and so if you analyze the situation, there seems to be some sort of a transfer of power when it comes to this particular trade. Um, and we will do our very best from the police department to nip it in the bud um, and to go after these bad actors. Because while last year you might have been complying, Clearly this year, you're not. So with all this gang activity in dynamic ferment, will the Home Affairs Minister agree to extend the SOE? The Commissioner has been pushing for it, but the political calculus is different. We asked Musa about it today. I believe the SOE ex uh, expires next week. I believe next week, Friday or so. Um, those are discussions that we are currently having uh, at the cabinet level. Um, and you will know soon enough uh, whether that decision will be made. But uh, I will not disclose that at this. It is that you are going to be charging any of the individuals. For instance, um, the particular SOE, if you look at it, has had great success in that it snuffed out, it flushed out uh, the the actors from PIV that took all of their stash to an island. And so they were, we were able to flush them out and identify all of these high-powered weapons and take them off the street, saving many lives. And so those individuals will be charged. The investigation uh, in relation to the two murders, those are ongoing. Whether there is an SOE or not, those investigations will, will continue. But even though several gang members are still locked up under the SOE, maybe it should be extended to some police officers as well. And that's because, as we reported yesterday, an officer was arrested and charged for raping a 15-year-old boy. 29-year-old Marcus G is accused of sexually assaulting the minor at the police station. Today, the media asked Minister Kareem Musa if... He is sure the other officers attached to that precinct weren't also complicit. That is a part of the investigation that is being carried out, Marisol, um, because like you rightly said, if it is happening at a police station, then of course there might be other officers who have knowledge. And so that is certainly going to be a part of the investigation that is currently being uh, carried out. But I join the commissioner of police in expressing the fact that I am extremely disturbed by this kind of news coming out of Punta Gorda by a police officer. Again, the people of this country have trust and confidence in a police department to protect us, to serve us, to keep us safe, not to be doing these kinds of things. And I know the argument can be made that we cannot control every single human being and what they are going to be doing, but this certainly is a black eye on the department and this certainly needs to be dealt with very stiffly. Another divisive public issue that police have to deal with is Michael Usher's murder in the St. Martin's area on Monday night. The compul spoke with us regarding the lack of urgency among his officers to rush the dying shooting victim to the hospital. He said he would have acted differently. Today, the Minister of Home Affairs chimed in to say that perhaps the officers should have done the same. I saw... Um the video footage um, and yes um, I did feel a lot of empathy a lot of sympathy for the victim particularly because I knew him well um, I knew uh, Mr. Usher well um, and to see him take his last, last breath like that on the ground 
uh, a few minutes before the ambulance arrived. It certainly uh, was very painful as most Belizeans uh, had to witness that, that take place. Um, and I know your follow-up question is why didn't the police officers uh, take Mr. Usher to the hospital? And I would agree with you to some extent, um, but as you know, they are not trained uh, medical practitioners. They are not trained to deal with injured individuals like that uh, in emergency training that is best left to a doctor. I actually had a conversation with a doctor at the KHMH who deals in this type of accident, trauma, fire, um, gunshot. Uh, wounds and he said the best case scenario is the police are not to touch the individual and so that is coming from a doctor that if an ambulance is nearby it is best to wait for the ambulance to come but again um, in a situation like that it did take a little while for the ambulance to get there and so um, I think in a circumstance like that where the ambulance is not immediately around the cor corner that perhaps the police department and police officers uh, should have taken him to the hospital. We do have training, you know, uh, in terms of first aid, uh, emergency response, but not to the level of training them to be these types of doctors. They're not trained doctors, they're police officers. We have to understand, or EMTs. EMTs, they're not EMTs. And so, um, yes, we do have uh, first aid training for our police officers. Um, but at the same time, we have to understand that there's a separate department for fire, there's a separate department uh, for doctors uh, who are properly trained. Uh, it takes years and years for them to be properly trained in order to deal with victims like this. Um, the doctor I was speaking with this morning mentioned that one bad turn that you handle a particular victim could result in that person dying because of the gunshot and the way that the individual is placed. Yeah. One bad handling of the patient could result in their death. And so there are two sides to that argument, but we have to look at it. Um, and, and certainly I, I think there is some middle ground that we can arrive at. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll talk to some visiting cancer specialists who are in Belize. Don't go away. Prepare for the heat and stay cool with a Reamer Gree air conditioning unit from Benny's. Choose the right BTU unit size for your bedroom or living room and enjoy complete comfort. You can also save money with an inverter unit that is energy efficient. When the heat is on, stay cool and comfortable with an affordable, dependable AC unit from Ream or Gree. Available at Benny's. Quality and savings. Upcoming enhancements to my social security. The new healthcare provider features seamlessly connects healthcare providers, insured persons, and employers to facilitate the payment of sickness benefits. Here are the enhancements. Registered healthcare providers will create and submit online medical certificates using their healthcare provider accounts. Insured persons will receive a link to view the medical certificate to complete and submit their sickness benefit claim. And employers will receive an email notification of their employee's sickness claim. Also, the insured person and their employer will receive a copy of the claim decision letter after review. Healthcare providers, insured persons and employers are encouraged to create a portal account to access and benefit from these new services on My Social Security at ssbportal.org.bz. My Social Security online portal. Social Security at your fingertips. Skip the trip to the bank and perform cash withdrawals at your neighborhood store with Atla Express. Withdrawals are now free and customers can withdraw up to $300 daily. 
All you need is your Atlantic Bank Visa debit card along with an ID. Atla Express is easy, convenient, secure, and near you. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. Right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss. Thirteen million. 835,700 eggs are eaten by tourists each year, fueling our thriving economy. Tourism means business. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay. You can also pay it with your phone. Babe? Yes, love? I need to go to Positive Baby Series B. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make the transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Charter means aren't we're navigating along the coast this morning the, the 2023 good evening good evening i'm shirley Kelsel, and here's what's ahead for you on saturdays tonight we've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight good evening with your news and the aircraft please you're watching the nation station channel seven Toyota Hilux was stolen from the Western Regional Hospital last night around midnight, according to reports. A security guard saw a dark-skinned adult and a male minor leaving in the vehicle from the hospital. But apparently, no one sounded the alarm until the driver of the truck showed up at 5 a.m. to see that it was missing. Police were called this morning and they activated the GPS tracker, which showed its location in Flores, Guatemala. The Minister of Police did not have the full details, but he said that the cops acted quickly. Very brief um, information I have. I don't have the full details of it, uh, but I am aware that our police department acted swiftly with our counterparts in Guatemala, and we will be getting that vehicle back. Do you know how they managed to steal it from the hospital? Yeah, I, I don't know the particulars of the, the theft, no. Reports are that the government has sent ownership documents to Guatemala and hope to get back the truck. The cannabis-infused candies incident that occurred last year April sent Republican parents into an outrage after school children got hold of the treats laced with cannabis. The entire incident was traced back to the police evidence room where 38-year-old exhibit keeper Mario Bustios allegedly improperly disposed of the gummies without proper authority. He was previously charged with 10 counts of negligent harm after 14 students, all of the minors, ended up at the KHMH. But the charges against Bustios were secretly withdrawn in October of 2023, and he was later served with a new charge of willful oppression. Bustillos appeared in court today with his attorney, Nazira Miles, where he was served with 14 pages of disclosure, including 
two CDs. The magistrate adjourned the preliminary inquiry today until May 3rd, so Bustillo's attorney can access the contents of the second CD in order for the case to proceed. Sixteen years after he killed mother of two, Sandra Ruiz, Daryl Grant apologized to her family in court today. Grant, who was already sentenced to life in prison, was back in court to get a fixed sentence. He told her family, quote, I am sorry for what I did. I was young and immature. I'm sorry to her family and for the pain to my family. I know I can't bring back Miss Sandra's life. Grant was Ruiz's neighbor when he broke into her house in the Kings Park area in August of 2008. He sexually assaulted her and then bludgeoned her to death inside her home. He also badly injured one of her two young children. In her victim impact statement, her daughter, who was 13 at the time of the murder, stated that 15 years later she can still recall the smell of the iron from her mother's blood after they had to clean up. Justice Nigel Pilgrim today told the now 37-year-old Grant that he will not be eligible for parole until after serving 30 years, which started on August 12th of 2008. He was initially sentenced to life imprisonment, but the new legal standard is that those must be fixed sentences. Once a year, the Belize Cancer Center welcomes a team of oncology specialists to provide specialized assistance to patients. We got to meet the team today and learn a bit more about the magic they've worked over the past few days with these cancer patients. Joe Marie Lanza reports. A team of doctors, oncology specialists, are in Belize this week working alongside the Belize Cancer Center, Dangriga. They hail from Rochester, New York, from a volunteer group named Interval. They bring a wide range of knowledge and expertise, assisting patients to get the best of treatment options and advice. The team is currently in Belize City doing their rounds, and today we stopped in at the center to meet them and discuss how exactly this partnership and medical mission began. We date back to many, many years. Uh, Interval um, is one of the volunteer organizations we have in Rochester Regional Health, and uh, we have been coming here um, and doing different medical camps since late 2000s. Um, I got involved in uh, coming to the cancer center in 2018. Uh, there was a little bit of a gap during COVID because uh, tra uh, traveling was difficult. Uh, but uh, uh, coming here and, and seeing patients um, has been very rewarding. Um, the, the team here does a phenomenal job of providing care to patients. Um, it's difficult. Um, we see the challenges patients face day in and day out, the delays they experience um, through different barriers that they have, of all the way from screening, being able to conduct the testing, and being able to afford all the uh, 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 care that they need. Um, and to be able to be a cancer survivor takes a lot, uh, both not only in the patient, but in the family and multiple stressors. So the team does a nice job over here in providing care locally, because uh, I can imagine otherwise it would be difficult to provide all that care here within Belize itself without the cancer center and Dr. Grant and Sister Delone. And he convinced us to come. Yeah. As I specialize in prostate cancer and Dr. Ketani specializes in the breast cancer. So it's a and we see a lot of cases here. So I think there is a need. I will say something I found actually very encouraging that every patient that I've saw seen is actually very involved with their health care. They know a lot about themselves. They know about their medication. We get really good and reliable history. And I think that involvement of community for themselves is the first step and they have, they have it down. So that's great. And I think we can build from there at this point. Although a week might not seem like enough for this team to complete their work here in Belize, CEO Pascasio says that they're on an intensive schedule. They see uh, both uh, oncology patients and they see patients with hematologic diseases. Much of what we have seen is their patients with sickle cell. We've seen a number of sickle cell patients and sickle cell, of course, is a hematologic condition. Right. <clears throat> so far, 
um, I would say that over the last three days, we've probably seen about 10 to 12 patients with sickle cell, either sickle cell trait or active sickle cell disease. Um, we are we're expecting to continue to follow those patients. Um, and then we've seen a sprinkle of, of patients with prostate cancer, patients with breast cancer, uh, and one patient, I think, that had cervical cancer. We've been, we've been very, very fortunate. Um, the value that they bring in terms of their services and their expertise to us is incalculable. Um, most of these patients would have to wait uh, and many of the many of the subject matter expertise that they provide in consultation uh, is something I think that we cannot we, we, we could not duplicate had they not been here with us. President of the organization Kim Simplis Barrow says that this partnership serves as a testament to the cancer center's commitment to exceed barriers to source the best care for patients. For us, it's so very important to have a collaboration and partnership with the Belize um, Cancer Society, uh, Cancer Center, Dan Griga, and with Interval. Interval, it's um, it's such a great collaboration. Um, and partnerships today, I mean, I think we're seeing like about 21 patients just here at the center. Um, they have been here for um, over the past four days. And so in Dangriga, they were seeing patients as well. Um, it is an opportunity that perhaps some of um, our Belizeans would not have, have had. Um, and it's always good to get a second opinion and, and, and to, um, to have a dialogue with, um, with professional uh, oncologists. Jo Marie Lanza, 7 News. The specialists concluded clinics today and will leave on Saturday. The Maya Mountain Forest Reserve is a 36,000 acre site situated in southern Belize. It's where the Hummingbird Group Limited has gotten permits and licenses to conduct logging activities sustainably. As a founder, Bobby Lopez explained that there are some trees that can cut and some that must be left alone to ensure that the reserve lives on. But when his workers went into the reserve recently, they noticed other loggers without the necessary permits, which alarmed them since they were engaged in cutting down trees and drawing survey lines. Yesterday, Lopez told us more about the encounter. Now that we're in the reserve, putting in our roads and everything is monitored by the forestry department. They're very, very strict with these um, long-term sustainable um, uh, forestry licenses. We come upon, about a week ago, a group of men in the reserve cutting survey lines. And uh, immediately we called the forestry department but our crew had an encounter with them and they're saying that they have met and I have a recording and I will send it to you because they specifically said Minister Cordell Hyde, we met with him in 2022, January of 2022. And he has given us permission. They call themselves Green Hill Farming Cooperative, something to that effect. Well, I got a call this morning that they're in there again and word is that Minister Mike Spat has told them to go in and cut and that he will see to it that it gets de-reserved. When are we going to learn to preserve what we have? What we have is long-term sustainable license. Give you an example of the 680-something mahogany trees for this harvest plan. We're only cutting about 60, 10%. The rest we're not going to come back for another 30 years to look at. So you see how sustainable it is. But further to that, our company already paid Springfield Nursery for 4,000 assorted forest trees. And we ourselves harvested seeds, mahogany and cedar and other prickly yellow and others from the reserve. And we have a nursery right now. And I'm going to invite the media out to see this because I know that this is going to blow up. And this tells me that elections is coming. When you tell a whole group, I'm go man, go cut it. And I'm going to get it the reserve. And we're hearing that from more than one person. We reached out to the Minister of Natural Resources, Cordell Hyde, who told us that he would not and cannot give permission to log in a reserve since 
Forestry and reserves such as the Maya Mountains are not his domain. We also reached out to the Chief Forest Officer, Wilbur Sabido, who said, quote, We have been following that report that we received from Mr. Lopez. We had encountered people in the past in the reserve doing illegal logging or hunting. We haven't authorized any surveys in the reserve, nor do I think that we will. And no one has approached us about doing any surveys. We're doing our own assessment and investigation to get some clarity about the situation. End quote. We will keep following this story. Over the past three days, a workshop was held with 26 members of the medical community from across the country to train them on the management of sexual assault examinations. Many times these examinations are mishandled due to lack of standards, and that affects any court cases that are being heard. This training sought to ensure that medical professionals are better equipped and have a set of guidelines to follow in the doctor's office and in the courtroom. The session was headed by a consultant from the University Hospital in Jamaica. At the closing today, we learned more from the facilitators. This is an extremely important uh, exercise uh, because in many instances, especially as far down south as PG or Corozal, you, there are cases where victims are not uh, able to see a doctor. Um, and many times the doctor may feel that they are not uh, qualified or certified to give evidence before a court of law. And so this exercise was extremely important. It does have some uh, legal technical issues because they are going to be testifying in court. Um, and so, yes, the medical side, they already have that uh, covered, but it was important to be able to uh, give them this training so that they can help in terms of the PACE justice program uh, of expediting the backlog, but at the same time offering justice to many victims across the country. The public system we have, um, within the last year, I think in 2023, we only had about 34 victims of rape in the entire country. I'm, this data by itself um, is might not be alarming to you all, but for us it's significant. Um, and uh, when we have this scenario, um, our officers, med mostly medical officers who are in the emergency area, are supported by specialists in the field. So many of our officers may not um, have this experience in, in dealing with these scenarios, so this might be a first-time event for them. And so it's a sensitization in, in where we need to go. There's some gaps, I think, in general. It, it's a Caribbean thing, to be honest, because we, you are where we were many years ago and i don't mean it in any odd way what i mean is it's the same sort of uh, fears that persons had the same um kinds of where well, we're not sure what to do um, we do something and s somebody says to do it this way and so on so what this training did was to help to identify some of the deficiencies and the gaps and then hopefully put everybody on the same page, both in terms of how to properly examine someone who has been sexually assaulted, and particularly the documentation. And then when you go to court, how do you conduct yourself? Because that's a, that's a big thing. This training indeed is integral within the Belize Defense Force. As you guys might be aware, um, unfortunately we have these instances in the force and this training by no means, um, by all means, ensure that we provide our soldiers with the proper um, treatment, the proper investigation that is, that is needed, and ensure that the management is top tier and meets an international standard. I was trained in Cuba, so being from a different um, area, we go on, undergo a, a medical legal course, but it's not as intense. So. It doesn't really qualify you or train you properly in the field of where you're working to actually properly um, handle different cases like this. So by with this training from a, a professional, someone that has the experience, uh, giving their you know their first their their basically bird's eye view of a situation, it helps us you know properly assess a patient that can be considered a victim of sexual assault or in the case that we were using, a survivor of um, sexual assault. The training was in collaboration with the EU and UNDP. And after the break, we'll ask the head of the National Forensic Science Service what 
he can do for the Silver Creek husband who hasn't been able to get a postmortem for his wife for over two weeks. And San Pedrano send a petition to the Minister of Sustainable Development. They say too much invasive development on their island. Don't go away. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. Right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss.
Almost a year ago, Colonel Hyde told the nation there would be an examination of land instruments regarding allegations of fraud surrounding the execution-style murder of businessman Ricardo Borja. We are looking at all the instruments inside our ministry, all the instruments that may have involved participation from this deceased, and to see whether we uncover anything that investigation or that examination. We don't want to call it investigation because police does investigation. Hyde still has not reported back to the nation on any findings, leading us to conclude no such examination ever took place. Now, another execution-style murder, which has just occurred in Dangriga, is once again being attributed to land fraud at the Ministry of Natural Resources. The unprecedented corruption and criminality inside the Lands Department is costing lives, and as the minister in charge, Colonel Hyde needs to do something about it. Or are we to conclude that he is okay with it? Please, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. Yesterday you heard the compo say that he will swoop in to assist Miguel Chocó, the southern man who hasn't been able to bury his wife for the past two weeks. He made a public plea for assistance because he said his wife is haunting him. Today the executive director of the National Forensic Science Service explained what the holdup is. We're not overwhelmed. I would say we're, we're experiencing backlogs not only because of the hierarchy is low, um, and also because one of our medical examiners retired in February and we're, we're, we're actively working on trying to fill that vacancy. You know, vacancies aren't filled overnight. Um, you have to make sure you get the properly trained, qualified individual. So we went from three medical examiners down to two. Two medical examiners on duty. Um, but the particular case this week was really unfortunate because we actually were uh, scheduling the case from last week to do the autopsy. I think it was April 10th. Um, unfortunately, the police vehicles that were used to transport bodies from the south of the country were, I, I believe, uh, under repairs or at the mechanic for repairs. Um, so the, the police actually asked us, we, we don't have the, the vehicle to transport the cadaver to the morgue all the way here in Laidville. Can you please postpone? So. It, the autopsy would have been done from last week if we had the, the transportation. It's regrettable, though, that um, sometimes the communication is not as it should, because if, if the, the police vehicle is, is down, which we understand, we vehicles have mechanical issues. Um, sometimes families would offer if they have the resources, because they would still need to travel to the morgue to ID the body to receive after the postmortem. So it, it, it highlights the need for not only yes, um, more resources for cadaver transport, cadaver storage, custody, but closer communication with families, with grieving families, um, if they know that they, there is a need for uh, a, a vehicle to transport the body, then the, the family can um, provide that if it's not a, a highly sensitive case. Because um, for, for homicides and, and cases where we, it's under active police investigation, yes, we need to have a very tight chain of custody over the body. But uh, sudden death cases, um, accidental deaths, those can be um, alternate arrangements that can be made in place. We'll let you know when the post-mortem is performed. We've been reporting on the invasive Clear the Land style developments on San Pedro for a few weeks and tonight a group of islanders are saying that they have had enough. They have sent a petition bearing about 700 signatures to Minister of Sustainable Development Orlando Habet. A covering letter says that they are concerned about quote landfilling, canal path covering, environmental impact, marine fauna, flora, and habitats in the San Pablo area. They're asking the Ministry and the Department of Environment to take action and address this issue. The letter states, we, the undersigned, request that the development is stopped and that the canal will be dredged back to how it was. We'll reach out to let you know what the Minister says. If you're thinking of going on vacation, you should consider heading to Panama. The Central American country is a quick flight from Belize, and today the Panamanian Embassy held an educational workshop explaining why you should give it a try and what incentives there are. 
The Travel, Trade and Strategic Alliance's director of Promptur Panama told us more. Welcome to Panama. Today's presentation was to inspire our, your, your tour operators and agencies to recommend our destination to Belizeans. We want you to come and explore our country, our beautiful city, and all our uh, priority destinations. Uh, Belize is just one and, one and a one half hours away from Panama, and I think it's an ideal destination uh, for Belizeans to go and experience. We in From Tour Panama, we collaborate with Copa Airlines. Copa Airlines is Panama national aircraft air, airline. And we work with them to invite more visitors to our country. And one of those strategies is the stopover program, which allows visitors to experience two destinations with one ticket. So visitors would have to book their tickets in advance with the stopover program, and they can stay in Panama from one to seven days with no additional uh, cost on their airfare. I know that Belize has beautiful beaches, so I think when you would come to Panama, you would look for something different that would complement your life. And I think our modern city could give that to Belizeans. Um, we have a big city, very modern, full of contrasts. Our gastronomy is very rich, it's delicious. When you come to Panama, you're gonna gain a few pounds. And also uh, we have a lot of other destinations outside of Panama City, and I want to highlight the Chiriqui province, uh, the, the districts of Tierras Altas and Boquete. Uh, Chiqui Chiriqui is a mountainous province. Uh, the, the weather is milder. When you go there, Panamanians even wear scarves but because we're not used to cold weather. So when you go there, you can visit our coffee plantations, learn the coffee process from bean to cup, and also you can go hiking, go up the Baru volcano, which I told you it's the only place on earth where you can see the Atlantic and the Pacific on the same day. So there's a lot for you to explore. It's a small country, so you can visit it. Um, in a week, you get to experience all of this. For the last three weeks, we've been reporting on the labor situation in Belize. Entry level and manual labor is scarce. Businesses just can't find people to do those jobs. We've heard from affected business operators. The Prime Minister, an economist and a CEO in the Ministry of Economic Development. They all acknowledge the problem, but also acknowledge that there's no silver bullet solution. Earlier this week, we spoke via Zoom with the man who has to come up with a solution, and that's the CEO in the Ministry of Labor, Valentino Shao. Here's what he told us. We do have a tight labor market, as we like to say in uh, labor economics, no? Um, that means that we are at almost full employment. Everybody who is looking for a job uh, technically is able to find one. Um, but while this is a good situation to be in, it creates new problems um, because then uh, you don't have the, the, the number of workers you would need as, a, as an employer if you wish to expand your business or you wish to do additional work within your business. And so you run into a shortage of workers um, and that's what we are currently observing we do have a, a tight labor market as we like to say in uh, labor economics no um, that means that we are at almost full employment everybody who's looking for a job uh, technically is able to find one um, but while this is a good situation to be in it creates new problems um, because then uh, you don't have the, the, the number of workers you would need as, a, as an employer if you wish to expand your business or you wish to do additional work within your business. And so you run into a shortage of workers. Um, and that's what we are currently observing. So it is good that you know, those who are looking for work are able to find work. But the, on the other side of that very same coin is that where employers need more workers, then they're not able to find them. One way to alleviate it, as you rightly pointed out, is to, is to import labor and encourage labor migration, which we already have. We, you know, the entire agro-industry, for instance, is very dependent on, on migrant labor. We bring a lot of uh, workers from Guatemala and El Salvador uh, to work in the citrus and banana industries, um, especially. But what would be an addition would be to expand this a bit more and um, probably bring in additional numbers of workers in order to alleviate the problem. But again, uh, this is not something you just do 
uh, without um, careful consideration. Because as you know, uh, we, we want to be careful as to who we allow into the country. But bringing in workers is, is only one um, step in, in addressing this, this current shortage of workers. There are other um, measures that we are looking at. We have a current active labor force of a, over, a little over 190,000 persons. Uh, but we do have what we call the not in the labor force or the inactive labor force. And that number is around 139, 140,000 people. Um, they're not active in the labor force um, currently. And so that's a pool of workers that we have our eye on. We're trying to figure out right now, looking at the statistics to see why exactly they are not uh, active in the labor force. So you start with the pool of people you have available before you think about importing workers. To more in part two of our interview, you'll hear how Shal hopes to reactivate that dormant part of the labor market. BL donated a total of 65 laptops to five high schools in the South Side yesterday. Utility has embarked on an initiative to provide students with the resources needed to study, conduct research and complete coursework with the help of computer labs and after-school programs. ACC Principal Nelson Longsworth shared more about the initiative. So our business program, I think, will be the one that will be the first to, ex to make use of these devices. We'd like to um, be able to um, get all our students who are in the business program to be able to reach a certain level with the accounting program that um, is widely used across businesses in Belize so that they, when they leave here they are far more marketable because of the skill set that they already have acquired. We also have a program of, with um, a group of students called Computer Solutions and these require I know, um, better de uh, devices that can handle the new software of video editing, uh, productions and so on. Um, they do programming as well, um, and other desktop publishing um, um, components to that program. And these kids, they end up leaving here with um, from very high level skills as it comes to the use of the technology, and, and can actually start up their own businesses, etc. Because these are becoming more and more what they need. And I think um, that I believe will, this will definitely push that program even further. The schools that receive laptops are Excelsior, Maud Williams, Sadie Vernon, Wenlizaraga, and the Anglican Cathedral College. And in other utility news, we now have more of our conversation earlier this week with BEL Chairman Andrew Marshallek. As we have been reporting, BEL has a capacity problem because growth in electricity demand has far exceeded projections. But while that is an issue, the problem really is that the power sector has been stagnant. And as Marshallek conceded, there's been no increase in capacity for a decade. We haven't had any new capacity put on the ground for more than 10 years. None. Now, everything is growing in the meantime, demand is growing, and new capacity needs to be put on the ground. It's not BL's responsibility to do that. The way it works is that BUL makes a request, and the PUC puts out a request for proposals. Right. They entertain the proposals, decide who's to do what, and then send them back to BL to settle the terms of the, IP, the, the power purchase agreement, the PPA. So that's how it's worked, except it hasn't worked. And I know you'll remember me telling you this. It hasn't worked. So that process has failed to put new capacity on the ground for one reason or the other, and we could engage in blame games from now to whenever. But the, the, the reality is it has not put any additional capacity on the ground. So BL has taken it upon itself to do certain things, make certain investments to put capacity on the ground in the shortest period, time period possible. 
the quickest way to get some power in was to um, upgrade the GFT, which was planned in any event at Westlake. And we also bought a mobile plant for San Pedro, a 21 megawatt plant that from GE. The, the reason why we've taken Westlake offline now and not later is because there's a date in May, two days in May, where CFE has already indicated they will need to cut completely. So I'm trying to get that done before that cut takes place. So while you're saying that... So you feel you're in a race against time? You are to some extent, but the, the consequences of it is load shedding. And you're, you're at a risk of load shedding in either case, from my perspective. You're saying that we're putting the, the, the grid in a precarious position, but we're not. It's already there. <laughs> I'm so trying to manage you out of it. And that's all we have for you on our newscast for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Remember, you can find a full transcript of the news at 7newsbelize.com and see the streaming video on our Facebook or our YouTube pages. Have a great evening. Join Miriam Abdul Kawi here tomorrow. And I'll be seeing you back here on Monday. Until then, be good.